Thank you for clicking on this video. And today what I'm going to share with you is something that most programmers, I would say, take granted for, which is readable code. And the thing is, I would also blame the people like myself who's doing tutorials and really don't think about what the students really understand. So for example, in this simple example, if you were to teach a for loop, and most of the time in any languages, you see the for loop looking like this, which is okay. However, the thing is when a beginner looks at this for loop, they don't understand what the I stands for. And then you explain, oh, the I stands for index. And basically this for loop will go through the different number that you have initialized. And then this can be represented as the letter I. And then at the same time, you probably have, you know, tutorials that say to create a variable, you can just type in the word var, which is a short form of variable, and then put in the word i and then just put the number one. So i stands for integer or index or whatsoever example. So the thing is, the person who created a blog or a tutorial or a video that teaches a simple basic concept like variables and don't talk about readable code, the people who are going to learn from them will just take it as, oh, this is an industry standard. Since this person is an expert, I can just create a single character variables that starts with the letter I. And the thing is, most developers, including myself, will not understand what this line of code means. What does I stands for? Integer, index, information, we don't know. So the only way for you to make sense of this variable is to type the actual word, which is index. And the thing is a lot of beginner developers don't understand how important readable code is because readable code not only help you in the long run where you have a project that runs for maybe more than two months. So when you go back to the source code, you won't be wrecking your brain what the I stands for. So by putting the actual variable name, you know what this variable stands for. You're actually concerned about what the developers are going to read in the source code. So having this habit, for you to actually naming all your variables inside a for loop, for example, if I were to swap all the i into index, it actually makes a lot of sense. This will not only help beginners, but other developers who are reading your code because most developers, most of the time around the world are able to converse and understand English. So if you were to put English full words, we are able to read the source code so much better. So this is one common mistake that a lot of beginner developers start with. And I don't blame them. I will probably blame those people who have created tutorials. And I also don't blame them because they probably started with that also. So I will say let's start a movement called readable code for all tutorials, right? Just put all over on Twitter, okay? Make it trending. Another thing that I want to bring up is that if you are a person from another programming language and then you are coming to a new language, I would say read the documentation or the, you could say the tour language. So for example, if you were to have a name that has two words combined, so for example, you are from the data science world and you think that data science is not for you because it's boring, it's a lot of cleaning up code and not a lot of visualization of data and you want to create UIs instead with the amazing Flutter framework. So you want to create a simple variable that requires two words. So normally for Python developers, they will put something like this first and then underscore index. However, in Dart, we don't use this kind of convention. Instead, we use the lower camel case, which means that the first letter of the first word of the variable word is usually a lower case, and the second and subsequent words after that first letter is uppercase. So it looks something like this. So lower camel case is a widely used convention for us to create our variables. So one thing to take note is that if you're coming from a different programming language and you want to learn a new programming language, always go to the documentation. So Dart has its own documentation and style guide. And let's see what we should use for our variables. So if you were to click here, 
do name other identifiers using lower camel case. And you can see creating a variable, you use a lower camel case and then so on and so forth. All right, the next thing is null catch. So what do you mean by null catch? So when you're learning programming, you are actually more concerned on how to create a function or remembering the syntax. And then you will probably create simple functions that you think that will usually run without any errors. Then comes the errors and you think like, oh my God, why are these errors just coming up? So for example, I have a simple function which is called print length where it takes in a list of names and the names are strings and it just go in a for in loop where it prints out the name length. That's about it. Pretty simple to understand I would say. And the thing is, you will probably think there isn't any errors that you can find in this function. However, there are two ways for this function to not work. So what do you think will happen if I were to put a null? So if I were to put print length and I were to so if I were to use the function print length and I want to put in the value null. In the static checker there's no errors but if I were to run this you could see that there will be an error that will show inside our console because null doesn't have the dot length function. So this is just my opinion but I would say that the tutorials out there do not teach you on the errors that you will probably face when you're developing your app or whatsoever. So the first thing is that there will usually be null values whether it is from your Firestore data or whether it is from a function that you forgot to not put or return any null values. So one thing that you can actually do is that if you were to have a null value, you can have a simple catch. So this is when null catch is actually useful. So basically to catch a null value, put a guard clause. Basically you want to guard anything that has to do with a certain value and you return accordingly. So for example, if our names is equal to null, then we will return something. So you can either return something else. However, the thing is this is a void function so it doesn't return anything. So what you can do is you can throw an exception. So what is an exception? So an exception is basically an error that you see inside your debug console or your console. So one thing about exception is that under the documentation you can put in your message. So your message is actually a string and then for example you can put in print length params is null. So why I put the print length function name? Because if I were to just put a normal exception without anything and if I were to run this, this would just then give me an error that says exception. So I want to make it a bit more specific and human readable. So when there is a bug, we are able to know which function it actually makes the error. If you were to put this, and then if you were to run this, then you have an exception that actually prints out the error message that we have created. So for example, print length params is null. So now we know that this is null. So another thing that you might come across is that there will be a value that is a list of string. However, one of the elements of value is null. Oh no, so how am I going to do that? So what I did here is I created a variable called has null elements and it basically sees whether the list of strings or list of names contains a null. So if this is present, then I will throw an exception that says print length list contains a null. So now if I were to run this, this will show that the print length list contains a null. So if I were to put this null again, and if I were to run this, then it will say print length params is null. So actually having to have all of these exceptions is really a lot of work. But this is an actual production kind of code where you will see this kind of exceptions and such. So you probably have to do a lot of null catches when you want to create a simple function inside your Flutter project and such. 
However, there is this now safety feature that is going to be implemented in a Dart programming language. So for example, inside this get length function, there is a string argument over here which takes in a nullable value. That means that this string variable that's inside the argument get length function can either be a null value or string value. So with this, you could see that there is an error that says an expression whose value can be null must be null check or catch null before it can be dereferenced. So this feature is called promotion. So it will say, okay, since you have a nullable value, you must put in a null check. You can return a value or you can throw an exception. And lastly, we have nested if statements. This is something that I have done when I was a software developer. And the thing is, it is really something that I really don't want to go through again. And there are certain things that you can prevent yourself or minimize the amount of nesting for your if statements. So it's a little bit of coding horror, which I'm going to bring up an article from Coding Horror blog. So there is this article from Coding Horror called Flattening Arrow Code. And you probably have seen this if else statement, whether it's legacy code or whether it's your own code or other people code. And the thing is, with excessive nesting, it will look something like an arrow. That's why the article is called flattening the arrow code because this is something that not a lot of developers like seeing. So there's a lot of ways for you to do and the first way we have already done it which is replace conditions with guard clauses. So for example, if you were to have some condition to run a function inside it using an if statement, one thing that you can do is you can do the other way where you put a guard clause where the condition is not true and then you throw an exception or an error. So this will actually make your code look so much better. So even though it is just one indentation, what if there is more indentations that you're coming from? Having this guard clause will actually flatten the error code even though we are flattening the curve around the world. So the second thing is to decompose conditional blocks into separate functions. So I don't really understand what this example is, but I would say that I would agree on this statement because if you were to have a lot of conditional blocks, I would rather have you to separate into its own simple and small functions because we want to flatten the error code, remember? The third thing is to convert negative checks into positive checks. So what this means is basically our mind is actually better reading positive stuff rather than two negatives. For example, I ain't not never doing that. That's a little bit confusing, right? So one thing to do is that you will say, I am doing that. So if you were to have a if statement, you probably want to have something that is something and then not something that is isn't. So if I were to make this into a negative check, I would say attribute something something isn't a release. So it takes a little bit of computing power in your brain for you to understand this if statement. So this is also flattening your computing power inside your brain in order for you to actually read the code or make your code so much more readable. And lastly, I think this is something that you should actually do is always opportunistically return as soon as possible from the function or throw an exception. So what he means is that inside a function, you don't always have to return at one point. There are multiple ways for you to return. So in the earlier example that we had, there's actually three exit points. So the first exit point is that we are going to throw the exception if our name C is equal to null. The second exit point is that if our list has a null element, we will throw another exception. And lastly, this is our final exit point. Even though it's a void function, we probably need to do something, right? Which is our print statement over here. So inside this simple function that you think you need, you probably need three exit points. This will actually help when you're trying to make your Flutter production ready. When you think everything will go fine, that's when everything will not go fine. So always have that thinking where everything is going to, so always think that everything is going to go wrong because 
it is going to go wrong. And my experience as a software developer back then, I had a lot of debugging experience where like, okay, maybe I should also, all right, I should have just put in a null catch. I shouldn't have a lot of if nested statements. I should name my variables so much better. So as a beginner developer and as a developer myself, I still go through these kind of mistakes. And sometimes I really have to really think about what are the different cases that a simple function can actually take in a null or even a list of null and that's why I'm really excited for the null safety check because once developers learn Flutter and there is the null safety feature they will actually be able to create null checks here and there and this will make their code so much more readable run better and being confident in production ready apps all right, so that's about it. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want more videos about how to improve as a software developer, whether you're a Dart, Flutter, or any kind of developer, subscribe down below. And comment down on anything that you learned as a beginner developer, intermediate, junior, senior, whatever, that you think is very, very helpful for a beginner developer to actually become a habit. So that's it. Stay safe and all the best. Bye-bye.